This is a satellite foundational course for Gozar on fog formation and dissipation with a focus on how to detect fog. I'm Scott Lindstrom and I will lead you through this training. Learning objectives are on the left. You'll learn which Gozar ABI channels and products can be used to detect fog's presence and to monitor its evolution. Note the acronyms you'll see in this training, boxed in yellow at the bottom. Subject matter experts for this training are listed on the right. Mike Pavalonis from NOAA and Corey Calvert from the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies. Brightness temperature detection of water-based clouds works because water-based clouds are not black body emitters of 3.9 micron radiation. The conversion of satellite detected radiance to temperature assumes that an, an emitter is a black body. For the case of 3.9 micron radiation above a water-based cloud, then, where the amount of radiation detected will be less than that emitted by a black body, the inferred temperature is cold. Clouds do emit 11 micron radiation more as black bodies, so the inferred brightness temperature won't be so cold. In this cross-section from a fog bank to a cirrus deck, you see brightness temperature differences over the fog that are related to emissivity differences in the cloud, so that the 3.9 micron brightness temperature is cooler than that at 10.7. Over the cirrus, subpixel effects cause a difference so that the 3.9 micron brightness temperature is warmer than the 10.7 micron brightness temperature. In clear regions at night, the 10.7 and 3.9 micron brightness temperatures are similar. This slide shows Himawari data over northeast China near the Korean Peninsula. The bands shown on this slide are also present on Gozar. The band 13, or 10.4 micron, imagery shows a fairly flat field. The probe shows temperatures from 10.4 and 3.9 microns at a point. The 3.9 micron temperature is much cooler in many places, which are obvious in the 3.9 micron imagery. Water-based clouds are filling the valleys in this region of Asia, and emissivity differences drive temperature difference between the channel and the 10.4 micron channel. Those differences can be used to highlight low clouds, fog, and stratus. The difference field between those two infrared channels would show signatures similar to this visible image from shortly after sunrise that confirms the presence of clouds in the valleys. But do those clouds extend to the ground? That's a difficult thing to determine from satellite data. Here's a brightness temperature difference product using channels from present ghosts similar to those from the Himawari scene. The BTD between shortwave and longwave infrared channels, 3.9 and 10.7 microns, has been used in the past to detect water-based clouds like fog and low stratus. Compare the similar enhancements around Pittsburgh and around Corpus Christi. BTD products view the top of the cloud. They struggle to differentiate between elevated stratus, as over Pittsburgh, and IFR-producing fog at Corpus Christi, because cloud base cannot be viewed from the satellite. Thus, there's a need for a product to identify regions of reduced ceilings and visibilities, and it was developed using flight rules definitions. Products generate include probabilities of marginal VFR conditions, IFR, or low IFR conditions. There's also a cloud thickness product. These GOES-R IFR probability products use information from the satellite and model data and other ancillary data to diagnose the likelihood of low ceilings and or reduced visibilities. Model data used are chiefly low-level moisture profiles. When saturation or near saturation is present in the rapid refresh model, IFR probabilities are greater. The statistically generated fused approach mitigates weaknesses in the individual predictors. For instance, satellite measurements are not very useful for diagnosing fog and low clouds when multiple cloud layers are present. Model fields tend to struggle when depicting small-scale fog events like valley fogs that occur at sub-grid scale resolutions. The fusion process allows for confident identification of MVFR, IFR, or low IFR conditions even when one of the individual predictors fails at highlighting their potential. Here is the GOES-R IFR probability field for the same time as shown earlier. The BTD field is inset. Note how mid-level stratus is correctly screened out in the IFR probability field over Pittsburgh. IFR probability includes values over Bismarck as well, and upstate New York, where reduced ceilings and visibilities are occurring under multiple cloud layers. There are no strong signals there in the brightness temperature difference field. IFR probabilities are very high correctly in and around Corpus Christi. Three different IFR probabilities are produced. MVFR probability, 
IFR probability and low IFR probability. Marginal VFR probability is the probability that MVFR or lower conditions are present. MVFR probabilities are always greater than IFR probabilities, which are always greater than low IFR probabilities. Cloud thickness is a Gozar product that estimates the ver vertical thickness, cloud base to cloud top, of the lowest water-based cloud layer. This product is essentially a lookup table that compares 3.9 micron emissivity to SODAR observations of cloud thickness off the west coast of the U.S. Gozar cloud thickness is not computed in regions of multiple cloud layers because satellite information on the lowest layer is missing in such cases. Gozar cloud thickness is also not computed during twilight conditions because of rapid changes in the reflected component of 3.9 micron radiation. The fields shown here have two distinct regions. Over extreme eastern New Mexico, the satellite has an unobstructed view of low clouds. Probability fields are pixelated, reflecting the variability inherent in satellite data. Gozar cloud thickness can be computed. High clouds are present over much of Texas and Oklahoma, and probability fields rely on model data, and they consequently look much more smooth because of smoothing that occurs in the model and because of relatively coarse model resolution. When river valley dimensions are smaller than the model resolution, as is often the case with small rivers in, for example, Appalachia or the Ozarks, satellite-only information is sufficient to light up a river valley with IFR probabilities, as shown in the MODIS IFR probability image on the left. This scatter plot shows the relationship between the Gozar cloud thickness, the last one before sunrise, that's on the y-axis, and dissipation time on the x-axis. The points on this graph were determined by hand for radiation fog only, mostly for cases over the southeast U.S. For example, if the last cloud thickness value before sunrise was at 1145 UTC, and it showed a cloud thickness of 900 feet, the best fit blue line suggests a dissipation time of about two hours later, 1345 UTC. But there is considerable spread to the dissipation time related to the observed thickness of 900 feet, from about 1.3 hours to almost 4. This example demonstrates the utility of cloud thickness in predicting dissipation time. The larger figure, cloud thickness, is the last one before morning twilight conditions, and it shows regions of values a bit over 1,000 feet over inland North Carolina. These values suggest a dissipation time of about 3 hours after 1115 UTC. The inset 1415 UTC visible imagery shows remnants of the fog bank. It dissipated completely shortly after 1430 UTC. Model data are provided by the rapid refresh, with domains and resolutions noted on this slide. GFS data are used outside of North America. There are differences along the model boundaries because model solutions will vary. Stray light issues occur around the equinoxes. They appear in brightness temperature difference products and they leak into the IFR probability fields also. These three figures contain brightness temperature difference in the upper right with a lot of stray light at 0430 UTC, IFR probability in the upper left, and Gozar cloud thickness in the lower left. There is a discontinuity in IFR probabilities during the transition from day to night or vice versa. Satellite predictors used during the day differ from those used at night. In general, IFR probabilities increase during the day because of changes in the statistical predictors used. The Gozar cloud thickness product is not computed during twilight conditions, but is available all night and during most of the day for single layer water clouds. Gozar will allow for one minute data. This is a handy utility to have when precise information on fog dissipation time is required. The 15 minute time step that is standard in the pre Gozar era is insufficient to determine with precision when fog will dissipate, as shown in this example over the lower Wisconsin River. One minute data is on the left, 15 minute data is on the right. Gozar IFR probability is statistically superior to brightness temperature difference fields in predicting IFR conditions. You've already seen cases that should convince you of this. If high clouds block the view, IFR probability can give a good signal based on model data. 
If stratus is elevated, IFR probability will screen out the region based on model data. Both of these examples will lead to better statistics for Gozar IFR probabilities. The validation here was performed using one day from each month, and there are roughly 1,100 Goz East scenes. The CSI for IFR probability is roughly twice that of brightness temperature difference fields for lower IFR probability values. Brightness temperature difference fields are challenged to provide information about cloud ceilings as a satellite sees only the top of the cloud. Brightness temperature difference fields cannot give information when high cirrus obstructs the view of low clouds. IFR probability fields in these cases can augment the satellite to give a more complete description of the near surface saturation. Gozar cloud thickness fields can be used to predict fog dissipation time. This concludes the Satellite Foundation course for Gozar on fog detection and dissipation. Thanks for listening.